Good morning and welcome to Homestead Community Church. I'm glad that I can still be speaking to you even though it's not live. I enjoy the opportunity to challenge you each week with the Word of God. I do want to encourage you to be reading along in your devotional books. I think it's very important because I'm not able to cover everything on Sunday that happened in the passage that you were supposed to be reading throughout the week. And I know it'll be a help to you as well as when I speak. I know that you've been paying attention and you know what's going on and you're familiar with the passage. So I really do encourage you to read those. Uh, They are available online if you have access to that, as well as I'll be dropping them off with the devotional books, uh, with the DVDs, that is. Um, If you would like more devotional books, just let me know. I can always drop more than one or two off at your house. Just let me know how many you want, and I'll be glad to drop that off for you. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 9. One of the reasons I encourage you to read along is that that's because we missed out on the transfiguration and Jesus casting out demons, or we'll miss out on that as I speak today. And if you're reading through, you understand those things that took place And it's important, the more we understand the Word of God, the deeper it means to us. But I want to start here in Mark chapter 9, beginning at verse 30. And they went on from there and passed through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise again. Now it's interesting, it says he didn't want anyone to know. He didn't want anyone to know what? He didn't want anyone to know that he was passing through there. Why was that? Well, every time Jesus went somewhere, he drew a crowd of people. And from the point on where he was in Caesarea Philippi heading towards Jerusalem, he was focused on preparing his disciples for his departure. So he didn't want a lot of people to know where he was because he wanted to take time to focus on teaching his disciples to prepare them for what was going to happen when he was gone from this earth. But look at verse 32. They did not understand what he was saying, but yet they were afraid to ask him. They didn't understand the message that Jesus was telling them about his death. Remember, as we talked about before, they were expecting Jesus to come to rule and to reign on this earth. After all, that's what many of the prophets had said. But yet now Jesus is telling them that he is going to die didn't make sense to them in their minds and yet they're scared to ask him about it because they think it should make sense and I think this is good for us for those of us who are teachers or maybe even parents or leaders how many times have you tried to explain something to somebody and they just didn't get it and you try to tell them many times and it seems like they just don't get it but eventually it seems finally they reach a point where they understand Jesus was a master teacher. Jesus taught his disciples so many different things, but they just didn't get it at the time. It wasn't until after his death that they seemed to really start to understand what he had been saying. Years ago, when I was in college, I was playing soccer, attempted to play soccer for the varsity team. I had come through a high school team, and we were a really good team, but that's because we were really good athletes. We weren't really that good at soccer. We didn't know that much about soccer and how it really should be played. We were just a bunch of good athletes who outran everybody and outworked everybody. So when I went to college, the style that the coach taught us was so different that I just felt lost. I just couldn't understand what the coach was trying to say, what he wanted out of me, and and every time he tried to talk to me, I just didn't get it. Well, I didn't make the team, and and a couple years later, I started to work for the team as kind of like a ball boy. Manager, we call it, but it was a ball boy, water boy. 
It was interesting though, as I sat and I watched the coach and I heard what he was saying. I saw him draw the diagrams. I was he was telling the people what to do, the players. I began to understand it. It began to make sense to me. Oh, I get it now. Well, Jesus is wanting his disciples to understand some important lessons. And we're going to look at some of these lessons here today. The first thing I want to see, Roman numeral number one, is that God's kingdom is different than the kingdom of men. God operates so different than we operate. Our natural minds think one thing. I mean, think of the idea that a thousand uh, years is as a day to the Lord. That We just can't comprehend that because it's so different than the way we think in time. We see letter A, that earthly kingdoms strive for earthly greatness. Look at verse 33 of Mark chapter 9. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent. For on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. Jesus kind of like, oh, you guys, I heard you guys talking about something. What was that you were talking about? Oh, they don't really want to tell Jesus because they have an idea that it's not really the right thing. Kind of like sometimes it seems when I go to my kids and they're watching something on, on TV and all of a sudden I go in there on their computer and they close it. You're just wondering, hmm, what was it that they're looking at? A few years back, my daughter did that. Finally, we're like, let's see what you were watching. And so we got her to tell us what she was watching. And it was a kid's cartoon, but she was embarrassed that she was watching a kid's cartoon uh, because she was a teenager at the time. But here the disciples are kind of embarrassed. They're like, well, well, I don't want to tell you what we're talking about, Jesus. But Jesus knew. Jesus knew exactly what they were talking about. You see, they were arguing about who was better, who was the greatest. And we still do that today, don't we? Now, my kids joke about it sometimes, but I've heard my kids and other kids and families, and they talk about who the favorite child is of the parent. And as a parent, I try to express to them that we don't have a favorite child. But you know, even there's arguments today in the NBA. Who is the greatest player of all time in the NBA? Was it Michael Jordan or, or LeBron James? And people will argue, and a lot of times it depends what era you were in. If you watched Michael Jordan growing up, you probably think he was the greatest. If you watched LeBron growing up, you probably thought he was the greatest. And there's all these arguments over who's the greatest and who's the best. That's earthly thinking. The letter B, God's kingdom seeks for godly servants. Look at verse 35. And he sat down and he called the twelve. And he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Jesus says, in order to be great, you must be a servant. You must humble yourself. It's not about you being the greatest. It's not about your power and your strength and your ability and all the things you can do and how many people honor you and praise you. So what does it mean to serve? What does it mean to be last? Well, Jesus set the example of that. In Philippians chapter 2, he says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not on his own interest, but also on the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in a human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. We celebrate it this weekend on the Christian calendar. 
We celebrate Good Friday. We celebrate the fact that Jesus died. We celebrate today on Easter Sunday the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. Well, those aren't celebrations that we just want to celebrate once a year because that's what we live for. We live for that life, that new life is found through Jesus Christ. And Jesus set the example for us all by choosing to humble himself and become obedient even to die on the cross. Why? He didn't look on his own desires. What did he pray in the garden? God, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus sacrificed because he loved you and he loved me. Jesus gave himself for us. That was the example of what it meant to be a servant. And he gives them an example so that they can see with their own eyes. Look at verse 37. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Well, why was this such a big deal? Jesus takes a child in his arms and sets him on his lap and he holds him and he says, you need to receive a child. That's what humility looks like. Well, that's kind of strange. Well, if you understand the context of the society of that day, it makes more sense. Children were looked at as kind of like unimportant. Until they reached a certain age, children were often pushed aside and many times neglected and not cared for. Why? Because children couldn't help you get ahead in life. All they were were a hassle, an extra thing. Yes, parents love their children, but to get ahead, to be power and prominence, children were like the least. Nowadays, it's a little bit different. We live in much more of a, a child-centered society at times. But in those days, by taking the example, Jesus says a child is like looked down on. It's like the low of society. You must be willing to humble yourself and even to serve this little one. And I think that's a great lesson for us, not just to be able to serve other people or to serve children, but more than that, is what a servant does is a servant realizes he is not greater than even the little child that's around him. Even that person that's down and out, that person that doesn't have a lot of money, that person that doesn't have a lot of things, that person that really can't get him ahead in life. Is choosing to humble ourselves and to serve others, even the lowest of lows. It's easy to serve those people who will be a gain to us or an advantage to us, or we can get something out of them. But to love and care when we get nothing in return, and all it does is cost us. That's what servanthood is. And yet Jesus says that is how to be great. You see, God's kingdom is so different than our kingdom. Second thing I want to see, Roman numeral number two, is that God's kingdom is larger than we often realize. In this past year, we were helping my son search for a Christian college to go to. And we visited several colleges that I, I really didn't even know had existed before these visits. Many of them were really good colleges. They promoted the gospel of Jesus Christ. They encouraged young people to follow Jesus. And I was quite impressed with many of the places. Now what amazed me is growing up, when I was in high school, we had a selection of four Christian colleges we could go to. Now why was that? Well, in our Christian circle, we only viewed these four who were in agreement with all of our um, ideas about Christianity, and all the other colleges, Christian colleges, were kind of like heretics. They weren't good. They were looked down on. So I ended up choosing a college, and the two reasons I chose the college I went to 
where it had the fewest amount of rules and I had the most amount of fun when I visited. Yes, I know, great spiritual reason for choosing a college, but the other colleges I went to had a lot of rules and i just not a big rules guy. But it's interesting that we had such a narrow view. I often had such a narrow view growing up of what it meant to be a Christian. And it wasn't until I started listening to Christian radio and I started hearing people presenting the truth of the Word of God. And as I presented this truth, I was like, wow, I've never heard preaching so deep and so biblical before. And I started to scratch my head to think about all the times I was growing up and all these other groups were put down and, and negative things said about them. And yet I learned more about the Bible from their messages than I had from many of the messages I had a chi- as a child growing up. And I started to realize that the kingdom of God is a lot bigger than we often think it is. And we need to realize, letter A, that our way is not the only way. And let me get more specific. Your way is not the only way. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing things your way. The reason you often do things your way is because you like it your way. How many times have I even said over the past few weeks, well, if I was governor, I would do this different. But I'm glad I'm not governor right now. The reality is we have in our mind the way we want it done or the way we think it should be done. But understand, in life, our way is not the only way. Now realize, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. I'm not promoting the idea that anything with the name of Christian is good. But what I have found is that there's many denominations who preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and share the love of Christ, and yes, they practice different, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're wrong or bad. Let's look at what the passage says. Mark chapter 9, verse 38. Jesus said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. Now this is interesting. Somebody was trying to cast out demons, and they were claiming the name of Jesus. But the disciples are saying, Look, Jesus, we put an end to that. Because we know they're not part of our group, so therefore he wasn't doing things the right way. No, it was very common in those days, really a lot like it is today. In those days, many times there were different groups, even in the religious sector of the Jews. They followed certain rabbis, because certain rabbis taught different things. You see, they had the law, but they would interpret the law in certain ways. The same we do today. We have the Bible, but we interpret it different ways, where some religions or some uh, denominations say, uh, well, that we shouldn't do this, and other denominations says we can do this, and they have rules and regulations based on what they think the principles of the Word of God are. I'm not talking about principles like thou shalt not kill or thou shalt not commit adultery. Those things are solid understanding solid teachings that sex outside of marriage is wrong homosexuality is sin those are solid biblical teachings but yet there's other things is it okay to drink alcohol Uh, what about the idea of smoking Uh, in michigan now what about marijuana what about some of these things why do we do them do we not do them do we as a church support them? Do we look down on them? Those are things that aren't directly mentioned in the Word of God. So therefore, a person is not a Christian or, or a Christian based on these things that are on the outside or sinning or not sinning, as we've talked about before. What takes place in this passage is they're trying to say, Jesus, he's not part of us. He's not doing things our way. But we need to realize, letter B, that God's way looks different for different people. This was something that I had to learn and am still learning. 
Because again, we naturally think that our way is the right way and the best way. What does Jesus say? Verse 39. And Jesus says, do not stop him. For no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterwards to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. He says, don't stop him. Let the man continue to proclaim in my name, because if he's doing it in my name and my power, he's on our side. He might not be doing it exactly right or the way that I would do it. But if he's not against us, he's for us. Now again, the understanding is, is we have to be proclaiming the whole truth of Jesus Christ. There are many false teachers out there who are spreading false things who don't believe in Jesus is the only way to heaven. And those are things and core foundational truths we have to hold to. Things like the virgin birth, the work of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Those are things we have to cling to. Those are doctrinal truths that separate false teaching from the truth. But there's others out there that are presenting the gospel and teaching the truth. Are they going to do it differently than us? Yes. But maybe they're reaching a whole group of different people than we would be able to reach. Who have to be so cautious and careful we're not criticizing others who have the heart and are doing the right things in the name of the Lord. I've had to learn this in our guest house. We have people come in and, our, in and out of our pastoral guest house from all types of different ministries. In fact, I've been uh, building a friendship the last several months with, with someone who actually works at the World Council of Churches. Now, I would not be a fan of the World Council of Churches. One of the reasons for this is it's so ecumenical, involves all different types of faiths, and I think some faiths that are actually teaching heresy because they're teaching things that are really opposite of the Word of God. For instance, they allow homosexuals on, on their board and, and don't teach anything that, that, that's wrong. There's other uh, religions that they allow to include that I don't think are right. But this man that I've been talking to, he loves the Lord. He is a believer. He's passionately on fire for God. And yet he does things completely differently than I would do them. He's got to answer for himself before God. I have to answer for me. Doesn't mean I'm going to change things to do it like he does. No. I mean, there's a lot of things that I caution about and that I do because of certain things that I've seen. And I think through things. But ultimately, they're responsible for how they do their ministry. I'm responsible for how I do mine. And the challenge that I think Jesus is giving here is to be careful not to continually judge other people. Even during this pandemic, there's churches that are choosing to meet physically. And sometimes I think, well, we've chosen not to out of a heart of love for people. And there's some churches who've chosen that they're going to continue to meet. And I can't judge them for their choice. They have a conviction from God about that's what God wants them to do. This is the direction that God has led me. And I'm not going to say my way is right and their way is not because the scripture doesn't deal directly with this because they can use a scripture reference to support their side. I can use one to support my side. But what does Jesus say as he finishes the teaching here? He says, don't tell him to stop. Understand if he's for us, as if he's proclaiming my name and exalting my name, he's on our side. Because what I want you to do is I want you simply to serve others. He comes back to this idea of serving. What does he say in verse 41? For truly I say to you, for whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Basically, he's saying, if he is serving me and doing it out of a servant's heart, he's not going to lose his reward. 
He's out here to serve me and serve people, and that's what it's about. It's not about them being part of your group and your denomination or your church. I mean, I have the privilege of teaching and preaching for two different churches. And in one sense, we have the same goal, the same focus. I preach almost the same identical message to both churches, but we have two different personalities, and we reach two different types of people groups. And the fact is, is God has made us different, designed us different, causes us to teach and to learn and understand in different ways and reach different people for his glory. The key is, is that we're out here to serve and to care. And I'm not going to put down and condemn other people who are truly serving God out of their heart of love. Now again, I understand that there are people that are teaching heresy and leading people the wrong direction, teaching people that are against the word of God. And I am not talking about those. I'm talking about the many different denominations or churches or groups that hold to the word of God, that hold to the core foundations of biblical truth. And that leads us to Roman numeral number three. God's kingdom focuses on obedience to the word. Turn over to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verse 2. And Pharisees came up, and in order to test him, asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Now it's interesting that it says this, is they came to test him. Why was this a test that they were asking Jesus, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Well, there were two main beliefs in those days. There was the one belief that divorce was okay for any reason. There was another belief that divorce was only okay in situations of adultery. There were these two situations. And they're trying to test him. And what they're trying to do, they're trying to get him to go on one side rather than the other to make the other side angry. They were trying to do whatever they could to cause problems. But notice how Jesus responded. Letter A, Jesus directed people to the truth of God's word. What a great way to respond. What does he say in verse 3? He answered them. What did Moses command you? What does he do? He takes them to the Old Testament law and simply asks him, what does the Bible say? What did Moses say? You know, that's a great way to help people today. When we have questions or other people have questions to us, the first thing we need to say, think about and ask was, what does the Bible say? And if we don't know, it's our job to search it out. Often we say, well, what does the Bible say? And we say, I don't know. And so we just give our own opinion rather than, okay, what does the Bible say? Well, they answered in verse 4. They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. So the Old Testament does make an exception for divorce. But notice what they did. They took a verse from the Bible and used it to prove their point. I've said many times that I can take a Bible verse and use it to prove a whole lot of things that aren't right if I take one Bible verse. That's what many cults do. You'll have people knock on your door from cults that will take certain Bible verses out of context to try to prove something. And here what's happening is they're trying to prove it's okay to divorce for any reason, because Moses said it was okay. You know, we tend to do that. We tend to take things and, and only take and, and pick and choose what we want to hear. Have you ever noticed in the news when it comes to politicians, whatever the news uh, group is will often depict the certain pictures of what they want to represent? For instance... 
Uh, I'll take two news networks. I think it's pretty obvious. CNN News Network is an anti-Trump network, anti-Republican network most of the time. Where Fox News many times is a pro-Republican and many times a pro-Trump network in general. And it's interesting because when Fox News shows pictures of Nancy Pelosi, most of the time when it shows pictures of her, she looks like this raving lunatic. She, they get the worst picture with her face in the funniest positions. Now I guarantee you, if you played back this video in slow motion, clip by clip, you can find some really, really funny pictures of me in my expressions right between one uh, expression and facing one way or the other. Now CNN, if it shows pictures of Trump, it's gonna show pictures with this angry and stern or mean look on him. And, and uh, where Fox News, they're gonna show a picture of Trump, more of this kind of proud looking like I'm in control. You know, and it just depends what pictures you show. Now I will say any network who shows pictures of Bernie Sanders, he always looks like some, some person with hair messed up, reminds me of kind of uh, Einstein type of look. Anyways, I haven't seen either network present a good picture of him, but uh, some of us maybe just, we don't have that ability to have that. But you know, it's interesting how we kind of skew some things to make it say what we want to say. That's what the Pharisees are doing here. But what Jesus does let her be, he directs the people to look at the God of the Word. There's many scholars and theologians who focus so much on the Word of God that sometimes they miss the God of the Word. The reason the Word of God is given is to reveal God to us, the character of God to us. Even when it comes down to rules and regulations, Jesus was often kind of an anti-rule type of guy. If you read much of his, uh, the things that he says, he says a lot more about what not to do or not to follow away the Pharisees who focus so much on these rules. Why? Because he wanted us to understand the character of God. The rules were given to help us follow the character of God. To help us know who God is. Look what he says in verse 5. And Jesus said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. So what he does here is Jesus says, okay, the reason Moses gave this law, because he knows that sin would happen. Certain things are given in the Bible because sin takes place. That's not originally God's plan, but God gives that in order to help accommodate for the sinful men. And what was God's plan? He said, look at the whole scripture. Look at the God of the scripture. What was God's plan from the beginning? His plan was for a man to leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. The two become one flesh, and that was God's plan. Now things happen, sin takes place, other difficulties arise, we make bad choices, we make bad decisions, and God gives word otherwise. For instance, the Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That when we make mistakes, God has given his word to help us understand how to deal with our sin. But that's not God's ultimate plan. What he was trying to get them to do was to understand that God doesn't want it to take place, but he does. And we can't try to make all our rules and regulations based on certain scripture that try to help guard people or guide people back to Jesus after sin has been committed. We see letter C that Jerry, Jesus clarified the plans of God. Look at verse 10. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. They were really curious. Jesus, what do you mean about this matter with divorce? Because it was a big deal in those days. And he said to them, 
Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Jesus emphasized here that God's plan was for man and woman to be married and stay married as long as they're both living. That's God's desire. And that if divorce is committed, it's adultery and adultery is sin. And that's opposite of God's plan. Now I want to pause for a moment. I realize that there's many people that I'm speaking to that have gone through a divorce. I want you to notice this, though. When he says here that divorce is adultery, he commits adultery against her. What else does Jesus say is adultery? Jesus says when a man looks at a woman to lust after her, he's committed adultery already in his heart. If you've been divorced, it's no greater sin than a man who looks at a woman to lust after her. The fact is, before God, sin is sin. We talked about this in the last few weeks. When you have messages on divorce, I know it's so, so difficult because divorce has a greater stigma than a lot of other sins do. But you to understand that God offers forgiveness. God offers repentance. God offers wholeness. And God offers healing. Understand that when the message divorce is given, the challenge is for those who haven't experienced, those, those who haven't gone through it, to understand it's God's desire that couples stay together. At the same time, for those who've experienced, understand that you're not a second-class Christian. Yes, you made mistakes. But so have I. So has everyone. We've lied. We've stolen. We've cheated. We've lusted. It's all sin. And that's why Jesus came. Jesus came to die to forgive us of that sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We don't have to walk around with guilt. What does he say in Romans chapter 8? There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. All of us have mistakes. All of us have sins that we've committed. Some are still kind of hidden in our closets where others publicly are displayed for all to see. But yet that's why we celebrate Easter. That's why we celebrate the death and the glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ because it's His blood on the cross that's covered our sins that purifies us, that makes us stand before God, not our own righteousness. Was it God's desire for divorce to happen? No, but yet God also makes a way of forgiveness. Was God's desire for any man to sin? The Bible says God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In conclusion, I want you to ask yourself these questions. First, are you leading by serving? You want to be great? It's not about wealth. It's not about power. It's not about fame. It's not about uh, how many likes you can get. If you want to be great, serve, care, reach out to the least of these. One of the things that I've just loved hearing about is from those of you from Homestead Church who are just calling people and staying informed and loving and reaching out to people. Even though you can't physically go do it, you still have that opportunity. That's servanthood. Loving and caring for one another. Secondly, how do you treat other believers who do things differently than you do? Do you put down what they're doing? Do you think that they can't be as good of a Christian as you? I went to a um, conference a couple years back, and two of the main leaders of this conference, one of them uh, believed in 
basically infant baptism, and the other was a strong believer in baptism by immersion. And besides those two things, almost everything else was identical in the way they preached and shared and the, the truth they did, except they had this disagreement. And it was kind of funny because they, they did a lot of bantering back and forth about this, this understanding. Now, now, in my opinion, I don't understand how scripturally you can come to the truth of infant baptism. I just I have a hard time with that understanding that. But, but beside those things, the gospel of Jesus Christ was very clear and powerful because they didn't believe that infant baptism saved that infant. They did it almost more like of a dedication type of a thing to God. And, and uh, as we talked through these issues, as they talked through them and joked about them, it was amazing the unity we could have, though there is this disagreement that for some people has separated them. I remember years ago, I went to pray with another pastor, and the first question he asked me, he said, i got to ask you this question. Do you believe that the King James is the only Bible version that somebody can use? I said, no, I, I think there's other versions. And they said, well, I can pray with you this time, but after this, I can't pray with you anymore, because unless you believe that the King James Version is the only version of the Bible, we can't have fellowship. And I thought, how sad that is, that we're going to be divided over something that, that people have argued about now for over 100 years. And these things that divide us and that, that we cause to put down and, and the types of churches or the style of the church and how they do things. We're on the same team. We just have different roles. We do things differently. Lastly, do you use God's Word and the character of God to direct your life? Jesus directed the Pharisees to the Word of God. What does the Word of God say? But then he went further, not just all the technical details of the Word of God. What is God's heart? What is God's heart? What does this word reveal about what God's heart is? That helps us determine more of what, what's right and wrong rather than the word of God. So a lot of times we want to look at specifics and, well, the Bible doesn't say I can't do this. You look at it, what is the heart of God? The heart of God is about loving people, about serving people, about what's best for us. Scripture helps us know that. It's important to be in the Word, but not just in the Word, but to learn about the God of the Word. I want everyone to bow your heads and close your eyes. As we finish the sermon this morning, I just want you to take a moment to let God speak to your heart. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that we can gather together as a church this way. I thank you for the technology that allows us to do this. I thank you for each one who's hearing your word today. May you let your word penetrate their heart and life, that it be not my opinions or my thoughts, but the truth of your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I do thank you for joining us via the video again today. Please, if you ever need anything, don't hesitate to call. Uh, my number is on the back of the bulletin, 231-383-2760. I'd love to help you in any way I can. If you have any prayer requests that you would like to have added to the bulletin, make sure you call Marilyn by Wednesday. That makes sure, sure she can get the uh, announcements or the the prayer request in the bulletin. Other than that, sounds like we're at least meeting this way through the end of April, hopefully May, we can be back together as a church. I want you to know that I love each one of you and I pray for you. Uh, let me know if there's any way that I can help and to serve you in any way possible.